people can walk in, and there's our presentation. So hi and welcome, uh, or buongiorno, right, to this presentation on modern enterprise Java from the ground up. And I'm very happy to be here, to be back in Lugano. Um, this is my first time here at Vox Day, so um, yeah, let's see what we're going to have for modern enterprise Java and whether there is such a thing. My name is Sebastian, born and raised in Munich, Germany, and I work for this company called IBM. And I do a lot of things on the Java side and, in general, enterprise Java side. So that's my background, a few Java titles involved here, as you can see. But in general, what I want to raise awareness is how to do such a thing as in modern enterprise Java, or whether there is actually such a thing as modern Java enterprise. So as we know, Java Enterprise comes with a lot of history and a lot of legacy, right? Who of you has um, experience with something like an old web logic back then or web sphere? Or, you know, oh yeah, you're laughing, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> but as we will see, there is actually a thing as in modern Enterprise Java or as it's now called, well, Jakarta EE. So a very br brief overview or brief, not history, but where we are as of today and what I want to show you, especially in this presentation, and then we're going to have a lot of live code and live demos because I think that's just more interesting, right, rather than slides. So that is the website of Jakarta EE. What Jakarta EE is, that is the successor of Java EE. So Java EE doesn't really exist anymore, and J2 EE also does not exist anymore. Um, the, name, uh, the reason for the name change is that Jakarta EE, the future of enterprise Java, will be involved in an open source uh, foundation under the Eclipse Foundation. So that is now the future how Jakarta will well, evolve further here. Jakarta EE 8 has been um, released, and Jakarta EE 8 is equivalent with Java EE 8. So all the APIs, all the packages, it's the same. If you know Java EE, then you know Jakarta EE. That's easy. So. What I like to talk about in Java EE, or now Jakarta EE, is, as I call it, quote unquote, the good parts, according to me. So what are the good parts? That are the parts that are actually usable and very efficient to use in modern projects. As you know, Jakarta EE includes a lot of legacy with, you know, soap and whatnot and technologies you probably don't want to use in a modern project. But what I want to focus on is the following is, well, we have things like CDI, as you probably know, for modern injection. Um, things like JAXRS for RESTful Web Services over HTTP, JSONB, JSONP, right? Uh, we have JPA, JTA for database transactions. Um, we have EJB, but be careful, only the one in the new version, version 3. That is really usable. Don't even look at the old, uh, old stuff there. And then a few other things for, you know, just efficient development. Right, bean validation, interceptors, and all things like that. What they all have in common is that programming model of a very efficient and declarative approach. You typically um, develop your business logic in, in plain Java, Java classes, and then you annotate these classes with some annotations, and that's pretty much it. There is not more, uh, much more structure required anymore, such as abstract classes or something like that, as you will see. So this is very efficient to use. Um, another thing that I want to show you and then talk about is this initiative that is called MicroProfile. Eclipse MicroProfile was started by a few companies in order to advance Java EE back then a little bit more because of, well, historical reasons with Oracle and how that innovation happened or not. So that was one way to evolve Enterprise Java further, and it's based on the same standards. So it's a smaller subset of Java Enterprise, but it also has a few modern projects that are not yet in Java EE or Jakarta EE. So similarly, let's have a look at MicroProfile, the good parts, again, according to me. So for example, as you can see, we also have CDI and JAXRS. So they are based on the same core technologies. But what MicroProfile also brings with are some projects to further well, evolve enterprise Java. For example, we have injectable con uh, configuration with MicroProfile config, or we have resiliency in a very efficient way with MicroProfile fault tolerance. MicroProfile metrics, health check, open tracing, there are a few other ones that are really usable, especially for modern cloud-native-based microservices. We might want to have a look into these standards. 
Now, what I will show you in a second is a project that actually uses both Jakarta EE and Micro Profile. So why both or how? Well, there are runtimes available, and this is one of it, what I will use, that actually make uh, use or that support both Jakarta EE and Micro Profile. Why does it make sense? Well, I believe in, in order to build modern cloud-native microservices, we need both technologies for like things like persistence, we probably need with JPA and JTA. Uh, we might have a few things from Micro Profile with the new additions, right? And it's a really efficient combination to use both. And what I have is Open Liberty uh, that is based on uh, WebSphere Liberty, which is a modern well, enterprise Java runtime that actually does support both Java E, Jakarta E, and Micro Profile, or any mix and match that you want, which is actually very efficient, what we will see. So just, now that's the uh, last slide for now, some overview to get a um, well, better feeling how these interact. We have Java E that comes with a few um, specifications. Micro Profile that comes with, well, some subset. There's some overlap, but also other um, projects. And now in the future, Java E will evolve to, or has been evolved to Jakarta E. That is pretty much the new, well, way forward. Now, for enterprise Java from the ground up, what I will show you is some best practices, how to build modern projects in an efficient way when it comes to how do we build them, how we ha do we have an ideal Maven structure, how can we do things like containers, Docker, and what, we, um, what we will have a look at first is this Maven project, which is a project that is called Coffee Shop, just because I like coffee. And that is, it will be deployed as a WAR file in a thin deployment artifact approach, which I will talk more about. And we only include two dependencies that are provided dependencies. That is Jakarta E8 and MicroProfile. Why? Because it's easier to include these whole dependencies as a somewhat umbrella platform dependency, so it comes with all of these APIs. Both of them ship um, CDI and JAXRS and other things, and um, they also ship, well, the whole, sub, uh, the whole combination of, of these two technologies. All right. And then what I want to show you is to, well, basically build and ship this project. So this is my command line. And in order to build this, what we would do, well, Maven approach, right? We will call something like Maven clean package. Or if we want just Maven package without the clean or Maven clean install, it depends a little bit on your... Uh, on your approach, and wow, let's do this again. This was really slow. Depending on well how fast your laptop is, mine is already a few years old. This should build fast, so that's a little bit slow, I believe. Five seconds should be three seconds or less. That should be an ideal build time, and that's it. So that is the build for building your Maven um, or your Java project. In this case, for thin WAR file for a thin deployment artifact. And this, of course, compiles all the sources, runs the unit tests, and stuff like that. So in this case, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, it produces a WAR file, and that is tiny, so 12 kilobyte. Why? It only contains the classes um, that we have. Target, oh, target, and nothing else. So if we have a look at the WAR file, we have a bunch of Java classes that we're going to have a look at in a second but nothing else, no jar file, no nothing. The implementation is, will already be contained in our runtime. All right. What else is in the Maven Palm XML? Well, a bunch of test dependencies, but they all have a test scope. That's it for dependencies. I have a few plugin definitions um, that has a specific reason, and just because I'm brave, I use Java 12. Who of you uses Java 12 in production? Oh. Nice. Okay, who of you uses Java 11, 10, or 9 production? Okay, a few, a few brave. And the rest uses Java 8, I guess, right? Yes. Okay, well, let's see. So that works uh, already if you want to have a look at more, <laughs> more modern versions. And what I will show you now is a very brief walkthrough um, through this coffee shop application that for now only uses 
Java Enterprise Technologies, so everything that's included in Jakarta. And then I will add some more microprofile stuff while live coding. So what I will have here is, well, a coffee shop, so I can have some coffee orders. That is this HTTP, REST resource, orders resource. I guess you're familiar with JAXRS, so this is how we define HTTP resources. If you know more about the Spring world, this is very much like Spring REST controllers, right? Same thing, declarative approach for HTTP handling. Um, we have JSON mapping here, and then things like HTTP GET to get the coffee orders, right? HTTP POST for posting. New orders basically means creating new coffee orders, ordering new coffee. And then a few other uh, things like JSONB for declarative JSON mapping, um, bean validation, and that we see that this works already. That's the nice story about Enterprise Java. It all works well together without any configuration because these specifications will work just out of the box. That is our business component, our coffee shop, where we say, well, please order some coffee. That is this poacher here, so this will be mapped. A coffee order has, well, a drink type, and then a status, and a bunch of other things. And then that's pretty much it. We get an ID, we store it, and then return and have a happy customer where the order is in the system. That's, that's pretty much it. All right, now in order to deploy and to run this, finally. What is a sophisticated way to, to run this? Well, I already have the WAR file because I compiled it. So I could now take my deployment artifact and deploy it somewhere. Right? Something like I would download like this Open Liberty, for example, and then run it. But the more modern and sophisticated way is to use well, what is called cloud native technology to use containers for it. Who of you uses Docker? Hands up. Okay, most of you, or a few. In order to build this into Docker images. Why should we do that? Well, then we have a sophisticated way how to run this application in always, well, a reliable approach. So we always run the same thing, whether it's on our development machine or later on in production. So we build it once and then run it anywhere in all of the environments. And another nice story is in Docker, we have an infrastructure as code approach to define as code how our um, runtime looks like. So that is my Docker file, sophisticated Java Enterprise Docker file, very simple. Um, three lines of code, or sometimes even two lines of code. We have a base image. Um, the resulting image will contain everything that our application needs. So what does it need? Well, Java, I guess, and some runtime, like my Open Liberty. This is what the base image will provide. And then I might have some optional configuration. And my application, of course, my WAR file that I put into the auto deployment directory, and that's it. The good news about that approach is it leverages the best practices of Docker. So if I build this now, Docker built, and call it, for example, coffee shop, then it builds very quickly. Why does it build very quickly? Well, how, that's the reason how uh, Docker works internally with so called copy and write file systems. So I only do some actual work if I have some, well, actual changes in all of that history of my Docker file commands. So for example, if I have my base image and the base image did not change to before, well, I don't, you know, I don't have to change anything. That's still the same image. Why copy on write? I cannot modify a layer. I can only, well, modify by adding other things, right? It's like Git works internally, just append only. Um, so if I modify the WAR file, for example, then only the last bit changes. That's a good news because we saw that the WAR file is tiny, it's just a few kilobytes. That is really fast. The same is true if, for example, let's build this differently. I built this now using my um, Docker Hub name as Stashner Coffee Shop because then I can actually push the image and transfer the image over the wire. And the good news about that approach is it also leveraged the same principle. So if you see, well, we didn't really do much work. I only pushed like, you know, a few kilobytes. The whole Docker image is 400 something megabyte or whatever. But the good news is I don't have to copy and paste these 400 megabyte around or send them by the wire only the first time. But then I just leverage what's already there, which is nice because I actually don't have to push what didn't really change. So that's the reason why I want to use thin deployment artifacts because all of the implementation, well, most of the time does not change. So I don't ship, you know, how Java implements HTTP or whatever. No, that's gonna be pushed in the server 
And this approach is therefore much faster to build and to transfer, right? I think that makes sense. So that is one approach to build that, but now let's finally run it. Docker run, port 9080, the default port for OpenLibrity. Run my coffee shop, and then finally the starts, the server plus Java 12, and then we can access it. Okay, how do we access my application? Well, it's HTTP, so I can use you know any REST client of my choice. I use curl, curl localhost 9080, go to my coffee shop, if I can type, project, so that is derived from the WAR file name, that's the context name, slash, well, orders, right? So that is the coffee orders. Uh, that is there, and once that is up and running, we can see, well, please give me the coffee orders, and you see, well, empty JSON. There's no order in the system, right? It's in memory, so there's nothing there yet. Well, let's change this. Let's finally order some coffee, all right? So that means we need to post some JSON in this case to the resource, right? Post some JSON here, application JSON, with the following JSON object. Well, it was, you saw it, a drink type. Right, that's what we had. So, for example, you know, cappuccino, espresso, or let's have an espresso, right? And we're going to post this to the resource. And then, if we're lucky, we get yes, 201 created. Now that means, hopefully, my order is in the system, right? Okay, this looks good. So then we can have a look at the order: espresso, preparing, and some URL. Okay, great. So that works. Now. This is the workflow that we have locally for this, you know, modern enterprise Java approach. So now we could, you know, change something in the code and then do this pipeline again. For example, if we want to run it using containers, what we had here, then a typical workflow would look as follows that we say, well, let's stop this again. I did what I just did before, the Maven build, right? So if I would like to rebuild this, then again, have to do the Maven clean package and after, why is my laptop so slow? It shouldn't be five seconds, it should be faster. Uh, Maven builds, then a Docker build, right? Again, that's fast because just a few kilobyte, I could do the Docker push or the Docker run again to run it again. So this is already kind of fast or modern. Um, took like, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds in total, but that's a little bit too slow during de development. So. Uh, what I will show you now is a different approach to make that a little bit faster, and that is the reason why I actually have some Maven plugin here. So what I want to run instead is, well, an approach that makes that a little bit more efficient to develop. I use what is called the Maven Liberty plugin from the Open Liberty uh, project, so Liberty colon dev for development mode. And what it does, well, it uses a plugin here to run my Open Liberty in a development mode, to run that via Maven. What I have to say, I'm typically not a big fan of to include a lot of Maven projects because they just make your build overly complex. The conventions of Maven is typically sufficient. But in this case, that has a real value, that has a real killer feature, which is it can run my server in a specific mode where I can make just changes much, much faster by a hot reload mode and by listening to my file changes. So what I can do, now, if that is up and running in a second, then I can, well, first of all, run the same thing like I had before. I can say, please give me the coffee orders. Yes, let's wait for deployment. And then, well, I have the same thing that runs locally, the same process, but now in a more, oh, come on. I don't know what's wrong with my laptop. It needs more coffee. Now, same story as before, but now I can actually make some changes and develop something. So let's add something. Let's add something from, let's say, micro profile. what I had. Before, it was just using Java E or Jakarta E, I should say, standards. But now let's add something like a health check in micro profile, using micro profile health. And I will point you to some resources how to get a look into all of these APIs. But for now, let's just live code something like a health check. And this uses, well, the notation of micro profile health so we have some annotations like readiness or liveness, or readiness or liveness probes, if you know that um, notation from container environments. So we will have a readiness and application scoped um, annotation here. And then we can implement some health check mechanism. Implementing something health check. No, not the response, health 
check interface. Yes, yes. And then now we can have a programmatic health check of, well, whatever we want to health check in our application, right? So for example, check a database connection check, whatever. Or in my case, I will say, okay, I don't have much here yet. So I will just say, please take the application name. And then as soon as this is basically deployed, then say it's just, you know, up and uh, build it. You know, that's, that's fine. Then it just works, right? So now what my plugin is doing, it will actually listen for all of these file changes since I now just, you know, created a Java file and all that. And now what it can do, it can immediately reload, well, whatever's running here. So I can say, I go now to slash health, slash health is the convention for this health check resource. And then I have, well, now this resource available. So for example, now I have the health check that I just wrote name coffee shop, status up, which has been live reloaded. Or let's make some change here actually. Let's say, please include some data. Data key value, hello, Lugano, right? Immediately we'll, uh, immediately we'll make that change. And then I see, oh, by the way, now it's included. Right, or I can change this, hello to ciao, Lugano. Wait for the change, and there it is, immediately updated. That is true for the, all of the resources. So I can just live code something, I can change even server features, it will listen for that, and there's my change. Let's include a little bit more features here. That is b very basic health check. Well, it's not that super interesting. What is more helpful on the development side is MicroProfile Config. That's a nice story to save us a little bit of boilerplate code. So in our application, somewhere in any managed bean, we can actually, well, add inject some values, some, you know, other beans, or we can now also add inject some configured values. For example, there is an annotation config property that is shipped by MicroProfile Config that we can use to, well, add inject some configured value. For example, some string that we now call, let's say, version application version or something like that. And that comes from, let's say, the configuration key version. Okay, you can do a similar thing with plain CDI. So that doesn't work out of the box because then you don't have a you know, produced bean for string. Or if you write a CDI producer method, then you can define that with maybe your own qualifier, right? And you can do a similar thing like this. But then you have to write that qualifier and write that producer method. Or in this case, if I say now I just want that to be included in my health check. So I emit, I emit that um, version. And then you see, oh, now it's there. Version 124. Huh. Okay, so where does this 124 come from? Well, MicroProfile Config has a few, what is called default config sources that it ships with. For example, environment variables, Unix environment variables, very handy for containerized environments, or Java system properties or a default path for some property file. Per default, per convention, microprofile-config.properties under your meetinf. So there is this configured version. Actually, the nice story is I can even change that version, 124 to 123, and my Liberty plugin that runs here will check that as well because, well, it is a convention path, so it knows about that default location and it will just, you know, include it and if I change something, then, well, I probably want to see that change as well, right? So that's, again, just a nice feature to get faster to turn around, right? That's what I want to do here. I want to be able to develop something, change, and don't wait for it, right? So that's, that's a nice story here. I can change even configure values, and I immediately see the update here. Okay, that, of course, also works in other code, beans, right? It, um, not only this health check, I could add inject some configured values somewhere, and then see that change. All right, now let's talk um, a little bit more about another feature. Let's let's take metrics. That's also a nice, uh, nice feature of MicroProfile. Um, per default, it already comes with some metrics out of the box. So if I go to slash metrics, then it will include some well technical metrics here. It looks a little bit weird. What is that? That is the so-called Prometheus format some kind of de facto cloud native monitoring solution. This is a line-based um, plain text format. 
where I can just include some, in this case, technical information. So out of the box, microprofile metrics will ship with some technical information about the implementation and the JVM. So I have the, I don't know, loaded classes in my class loader. I have some garbage collection, garbage. I have some memory, some CPU information, right? So that's all technical stuff. And then I could use Prometheus, for example, to scrape this information and then display it in a fancy dashboard, right? Or, probably even more helpful for your business, I can include and extend that with some business-related metrics. For example, something that is more meaningful to your business questions, right? How many coffees have been ordered in the last hour? Or how many, I don't know, cars have been produced? Things like that. So business-related metrics. Um, for that reason, microprofile metric also comes with an API that we can use in our code. So when I say I have my coffee shop, for example, I can inject a metric counter to well, see how many coffees have been produced. So I can have some API and then um, some declarative approach of, for example, injecting some type of metric. There are multiple types like counter, histogram, gauge, whatever we want to measure. Or even easier, I can have an approach like add counted on a method and then it will, well, literally count the method invocations. For example, this might make sense here. Let's say coffees the score total, so the total number of ordered coffees in this case. So again, that is of course also being detected. I can reload that and then um, I can, where is my, I can um, create some new coffee orders, right? One, two, three. And now I expect, well, a new metric under my metrics. Long name, package name, underscore coffees total is three. So the total number of orders coffees is like this, and then you know, you can use that information somewhere in, in your monitoring or for uh, reporting purposes. So that is now a, a business use case of this metrics. So that's another just nice feature about um, what to include with microprofile metrics. But anyway, that's about um, it for a more pragmatic development workflow. So this is why I use this well, Maven plugin just for developing purposes. And then what you do, well, in your proper CI/CD pipeline, you would do the similar steps what I showed you before with a Maven approach, such as Maven package, then Docker build, then of course Docker push and push that to some environment. Um, what else I might have is testing. So in order to test, what I could do, well, I could include some tests and there is one basic notation in Maven that I always try to leverage, which is the convention of, well, surefire tests or uh, fail-safe tests or typically called unit tests, integration tests from a Maven notation. The difference is how you name your test. So this one is called coffee shop test, test at the end. So that um, standard um, uh, schema makes it a surefire test. So if I say test coffee creation, I don't know, in this case, I of course just print hello, assert true, right? So that always will be green. So I could test something on a unit test level in my code. But the point is, well, if I run this test or basically here, that means if I run Maven package, for example, or Maven clean package or Maven install or Maven verify, then now it will always run um, this, God, why is it so slow? this unit test in the Surefire plugin. So that's the default convention. I don't need to configure that. It will just take it by the default naming convention and then say, say hello. So this runs all that, these tests. What else is included is a notation of integration tests or per default IT for integration tests. These will not be executed. So integration tests, that might be code level integration tests or what I'm a bigger fan of are what I would call smoke tests that connect against a running application, a running system, and that typically, or hopefully, run fast. So what this does, it basically checks whether, in this case, my system is up and running and my application version is equal to a specific value. So in order to explain that, let me first run this in the IDE. That connects to a running system, a running coffee shop that runs locally, I don't know what's wrong with my computer. It's running, you don't see it, but my IDE is working. 
And at some point, I mentioned this runs fast, right? <laughs> at some point, it will connect here and say, oh, by the way, this is failing because I expected the version to be 124 and now it's 123. Well, so what this test does is it has coffee shop system, which is also a test class here, which is basically a small HTTP client that only connects to my local host application here, right? And checks for the health check whether, well, first of all, it's up and running and whether it has the version 123 or in this case 124. So now you m remember I changed this version from 123 to 124. So basically what I can do is to change it back and I still have this running process running locally. So now if I have this, um, this change in my application. I can rerun my tests, and now the tests are green, right? So that is also a workflow or an approach that I would advise you to do, uh, to, do to write your tests, whether they are code-level tests or here more end-to-end -end system tests like, in a way that they run fast. Because the tests themselves don't need to start up something like, you know, an embedded environment, embedded container, such as a Killian test or a CDI unit or spring tests in the spring world, but basically connect to something that is already running. Like this approach that I have with my plugin. Why? Because it's much faster, the development turnaround, right? What I can do now is, you saw it before, I can change some code, right? I can implement some new feature, whatever, and then when I'm done, I basically rerun my system tests that connect to this running application in the same way like a client would, and it's just running fast because the test is not setting up some test environment. It's basically just an HTTP client that connects against what is already running. So, you know, I can change some configuration. I can change my test, rerun it, rerun it, whatever. This plugin that I'm using even can run the tests. If I hit enter, then it will first run the unit tests and the integration tests, which is also fast. Or you run it in the command line again. Um, that is another way. So there are at least three different ways to run these tests. If I run Maven fail-safe integration test, fail-safe verify, then it will not run the unit tests, but only the fail-safe tests, my IT in this case, right? So same story, I can run it also in that way, bless you. So that is basically a best practice, how to build up tests. If you're interested more in that, this is a whole you know, topic on its own. I'm actually right now, um, publishing a whole article series on my blog, how to do efficient testing for enterprise projects. So these are two aspects of it. Basically, just make sure that your development workflow stays productive on that side, right? All right, let's, just for fun, let's code a little bit more on the Java um, side so you see that uh, all of that works. Let's say we, we have our coffee orders, and in our order, we now want to have a new feature such, such as a price, right? If you order some coffee, it should display a price. Maybe you have seen that in my properties. I have some price um, depending on the coffee type. So by doing that, I can show you that microprofile config can also be used in a programmatic way, not just by injecting. So assuming we have something like a price here. By the way, never do floating points in real world for price information, right? Don't do this at home. Just an example. All right, uh, status here includes getter setter for the price. And now in my, where is my coffee shop? business component, let's say here, if I order a coffee, I want to set that price according to, well, whatever will be configured, right? So let's say order set price from, well, let's outsource this logic to a price calculator. Um, if I can type price calculator, yes. Let's create a class somewhere here. A different package, price calculator, and then I will use this component to say, well, price calculator calculate, difficult word, a price for the order, and then of course set the price here, right? So I will calculate the price for a specific order, and in this case, oops, what we will see, well, the order depends on the configured well, type. An espresso might be a different um, type than, you know, cappuccino or something like that. So let's say we have a private double get configured price for a specific um, coffee type, right? So depending on the type, we will get, well, a specific um, configured price, which you can see here in the properties file. So espresso, you know, has a different price than a latte. In this case, we can, well, actually return that also in a programmatic approach. So if we get 
how we do this is we get a config provider, and then we say get config, which gives us a programmatic approach to load such a config. So for example, we can say let's load this value for a configured key. And the key is, well, what we saw before, um, coffee.prices, coffee.prices dot, well, the type and the enum name, lowercase. So we build this, construct that together, and then please return it as, well, of course, a double value, right? So that is the value that we want to have. And then, well, return that, that configure price for, of course, our coffee order type, right? Make sense? Yes, no? Okay. Now what you see, so this looks good. Again, I can just let this plugin you know, be up and running and it will recompile, recompile, of course, make errors, won't uh, compile, won't compile until it will. So it doesn't matter if that's just uh, keeping up and running in the, in the meantime. And now if I access this, okay, that did not happen. Let's see what might happen here that I have to recompile the classes manually. So in the worst case, what I will do, I choose, I introduce some class change depending on, well, which class have been compiled first. Why? Because as an optimization, um, this plugin opt, um, will, con, uh, will compile individual classes and swap the individual classes under the running runtime. This is why it updates so fast. So there are ob other plugin or approaches available where you literally can rebuild the project on a file change, but this approach is just faster. So in you know the worst case, you have to restart it. Let's show this in a nicer way. So one or 1.0 is the price for an espresso. I don't know whether that's expensive or not. But that is the configure price. Okay, let's try a latte. Type, um, oops, latte. And then, you know, we get all coffee orders, what we saw here. And then we can access it again using this URL, and then we see, okay, three and a half euros or francs or whatever. All right, so this is one way how to programmatically get that price information, and again, a way how to have a live reloading approach well, we can just develop a little bit faster, so just for a modern approach. All right, what else do we have? So we have Docker images. Um, who of you use some um, Kubernetes, some container orchestration already, such as Kubernetes? Okay, so of course Kubernetes supports, well, all kinds of technologies because it's abstracted away in containers. Whatever your container is running, that will actually be transparent to Kubernetes. It just runs Docker contain or containers, which is an abstraction over a Linux process. So of course, it supports modern enterprise Java as well. And it actually makes a lot of sense. Why? Well, it makes a lot of sense to put Java Enterprise into containers, as we saw, because of the leverage of this cop copy on write file systems that Docker uses, for example. So it's very quick to build and transfer contain container images. So in the same way, what I can have a Kubernetes cluster, and I have one here, is um, connected by cube control. So if you know about Kubernetes, you might have seen that before, right? So we have a coffee shop that runs here as a service, and we have a pod. A pod is an abstraction over a running one or more running containers. A pod coffee shop, so actually this coffee shop example runs in my cloud. I use the IBM cloud for managed Kubernetes. There are a few. Um, available, so we run this magic script to get the cluster IP of my Kubernetes cluster here. As you can see, I can actually access this via coffee shop slash orders. So now I get a similar response via, well, something that runs in my cloud. And then I can, you know, order some coffee, espresso via the cloud. Say, okay, now this works, and then my Kubernetes cloud service includes this coffee order for espressos as well, right? So that is just the next step, how to run it. How did I create this Kubernetes uh, environment? Well, by writing some nice YAML files, right? So if you know about Kubernetes, you might have seen that before. 
what I create here is a so-called service, right, for this coffee shop and then a deployment. So again, there is not much included for the Java enterprise side. It's just to show, well, it makes a lot of sense. It's supported well to run this with enterprise Java. What I basically specify in my deployment is to say, hey, please run one instance of my application that I built using this Docker image. Run this Docker image as a container here. I have some, you know, probes. You remember about this health checking mechanism, right? And I run one instance, right? The nice story about these modern cloud native um, technologies is that it's built again around automation and the notation of infrastructure as code. So what I specify here in this fancy YAML files is just the target state how my whole environment should look like, right? Similar to a Docker file where I specify how one instance should run. Here I specify how the whole, you know, service structure and how many instances want to have look in a target state. And then I can apply this against my, you know, cluster cloud technology and it will spin up one instance. Or if I say, hey, one is not enough, I want to change this from one to two, then I only change the declarative approach here in this infrastructure's code file. I can reapply it and it will start up a second instance. Well, we can do that. We can say, please apply now deployment here. And then it says, well, everything there did not change except the deployment. So then it will just start up a second pod here, a second instance. That's as easy as that. That is the beauty of this automation and modern technology. Again, very well supported with the enterprise Java approach here. So that is uh, the other story there. So just as some key takeaways, what I think makes a lot of sense is to have a look at this modern approach of enterprise Java technology, mostly because of the fact that it has a new name and it's, you know, looks uh, pretty new, but it's very much used in known technology. Most developers know already about, you know, CDI, they have used JAXRS, or even a JPA, JTA, even if they know Spring, then, you know, there's very much overlap. They've probably used serverless or something like that before. All of that is included in Enterprise Java. And the other nice thing is it really, you can focus on solving a business problem because you don't have to worry about writing all of these, you know, lower level details. You don't write HTTP handling or database transaction handling yourself. You simply can write your code in plain Java classes and annotate a few things like, you know, at path for your JAX REST resource. And then the whole implementation and the handling will be done by your runtime. And all of that is provided by your runtime. You don't even have to ship all of the uh, implementation in your deployment artifact. Right? You remember thin deployment artifacts approach. And then I think the combination of Jakarta and MicroProfile is awesome. It's a very um, interesting and efficient combination for modern projects, especially if you use, you know, cloud-native technology. And it's also interesting if you have existing investment in Enterprise Java, right? If you have something like legacy projects that use, I don't know, WebSphere, WebLogic, something like that, it just makes sense to stay within Jakarta or Java E. Why? Well, because then you don't have to throw away your whole code, right? Because the APIs are still the same. Everything that was in Java E or in J2EE is still there in Jakarta E. Right? And then you can have a much more gradual or slower migration to a modern approach, and you don't have to rewrite everything from scratch. You can use the same well, classes, the same source code, and just gradually modernize it. Then what I always like, if you keep it simple and leverage the conventions of a build tooling, for example, this is why I really want a clear and plain Maven approach, for example, just with not a lot of XML over usage. No, keep it simple. Use the conventions. You don't have to configure stuff. You can use the conventions of the uh, test naming uh, scenarios, for example, or the plugins that are included or not. So I use Maven to build, you know, uh, the Java artifacts. I use Docker, plain Docker build to build the images just because it's the easiest way, right? I don't have to configure a lot of stuff. That just, I believe, makes sense. But then use that time to invest into proper testing, and of course, proper automation, right? To build up a sophisticated pipeline, how to deliver your project. While at the same time, you can have a look at tools that just make your developing a little bit more efficient, like this approach of the Liberty plugin that you saw, just because it's much more fun to interact and to develop in such, uh, in such a way. And you can see with 
modern enterprise Java, it's really, I believe, joyful to write modern enterprise Java applications. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. You can get all of the resources and the code if you follow just the first URL. You have to just memorize that, and then you get the source code and some links to some further examples and further technology. Also, shameless blog, I wrote a book on modern Java EE that you can um, have a look. Just on my website, you get that information as well.